Hello, welcome to Web of Stories. My name is Melinda and I am here with my weekly reading update. Um, so we are almost done with September. Can you believe it? It's almost October. I'm excited. October is my favorite month. Um, it's my son's birthday in exactly one week. And then it gets all, we're, we're already getting our fall weather here. Although I think next weekend it's supposed to get warm again. At least the last time I checked the forecast, but I'm looking out my front window and there's a big yellow tree out there. It's all really nice. And the cat is sitting here glaring at me. She got a pedicure last night, so I'm not her favorite person. <laughs> She's glaring at me. So if, if my tripod falls over at some point, that's just the cat making her presence known. Anyway, I had um, a really good reading week. I'm going to try and make this a shorter video because my husband's going to come down at any moment and make breakfast. And I'd like to finish this instead of having him do it in the middle of the video like he normally does. So last week I finished four books. So the first book I finished, I read this digitally, but I do have a print copy. And that is The Secrets of Heartwood Hall by Katie Lumsden, who is on you, uh, booktube as Kate of Books and Things. Um, I really enjoyed this. It's a very kind of Bronte-esque novel. Um, I really didn't know where the plot was going. I quite liked that. I liked that the plot really kept me on my toes and I appreciated that. Um, I, it was a page turner. There were times when I wished the writing had a little bit more nuance, but this is also Katie's first book. She's a copywriter, so she's really, she's really familiar with the mechanics of language and you can see that in this. Um, it's not super, it's not the sort of flowery prose that you would expect from a Victorian novel. This is a book, obviously not written in the Victoria period, but set in the Victorian period. So um, I recommend this one. This one was actually very, it was, I really enjoyed this one. And I'm really happy to have this copy because I won it in a giveaway. And it's signed. And then I finished, um, and I spoke about this in my um, short story update, I finished Address Unknown by Katherine Cressman Taylor. Um, this was like an A-plus book for me, or A-plus story. So first of all, I thought it was a novel, but I read the whole thing, including the foreword and the afterword, in half an hour. So it's a short story. <laughs> but I got it out of my library as a single title, so it's being, it's being counted as a book. Um, and it's also being counted as one of my short stories. So it's a really interest it's really interesting, but it's also very chilling. This story was written, was published in 1938, which is very important because we know what happens in 1939. Uh, we know that we're that World War World War II has not yet started. And but we're already seeing things that are happening with it. And this is a story of two friends. Um, it is, I think, insinuated in the narrative that they had come from Germany to the United States and settled in San Francisco during or right after World War I. One of the friends is Jewish, one is not. When I first um, heard about this, this story, um, I was under the misconception. Uh, one of the friends goes back to Germany. I was under the misconception it was the Jewish friend that went back to Germany. It is not. It's the non-Jewish friend that goes back to Germany. Good thing, because in 1938, if you're Jewish, San Francisco is great, Berlin is not. <laughs> um, but that's sort of the whole point of this. So it's an epistolary short story um, with the letters between these two friends. And it starts out, you know, um, they're very close. They're almost like brothers. And I can't remember the one who went to Germany. I can't remember his name, but the Max is the one who stayed in the United States, the Jewish one. You know, Max writes his friend, you know, I miss you. I hope you have a great time in Germany. I'll tell me what your life's like. And the friend writes back, he says, yo, we're settling in. The kids really miss you. Um, you know, it's nice to be home, but it's, you know, it's a little different. There's some weird things going on here, but we miss you, say, the kids say hi. And the next letter, it may, or maybe it's the one after that, you know, Max is like, yeah, you know, I hear, we're hearing about this Adolf Hitler guy. What's going on with that? And then you see the stories that are coming back to Max from his friend in Germany. You see him basically be radicalized. And um, it kind of is a chilling end. Now, it's really hard for, I mean, it, it's hard and it's easy to look back and say, how would I have experienced this if I had read it in 1938, not knowing what would happen? Um, I don't, you know, would I believe what was going on? Pro I mean, I don't know. I, I don't know. Now, looking back, obviously, I know what happens. So I see what's going on. But it's also a really stark um, 
comparison to what's going on now, as I explained in that video, this is really echoes, I mean, I shouldn't say, you can see the similarities between the radicalization to the Nazi party and the radicalization to the MAGA movement that is going on now. You can see how they're similar. Um, I might talk more about that in that video, um, which I will put up here. That's just my short story video. And then I finished, finally, <laughs> I finished the audio of Tom Lake by Ann Patchett, narrated by Meryl Streep. I loved it. It's wonderful. It's absolutely delightful. I am glad I listened to it because Meryl Streep is fantastic. Um, I did go slowly with it because I've said on videos before that audiobooks tend to, I tend to prefer audiobooks that are nonfiction or are books I've already read before or are sort of like light propulsive fiction that you just sort of glide along with like thrillers and things like that. And Tom Lake is not any of those things. So I really devoted my attention to it and I wouldn't do anything else other than pace my house <laughs> while I was listening to it. Because of that, you know, I would only listen to like one chapter a day. So it took me a while, but I'm glad I really enjoyed it. Um, this is an idea I'm putting out here because I'm going to bring it back in a second, but it is a pandemic novel sort of. The, pan the idea of the COVID pandemic kind of sets it up for the situation where Laura, the main character, can tell her daughters the story because they're all there together. But the pandemic is really not that big of a deal. It's just that's what provides the opportunity for this story. Um, I say that because I know people have different feelings about pandemic novels. And if you're someone who, who kind of struggles with pandemic novels, which I totally understand, um, I would say you don't have to worry about this one because it doesn't, it's not, it's not about that pandemic. Um, it is, I would consider it historical fiction. Now, I know with my debates with the sentence on whether the sentence is a historical fiction or not, there is that whole debate, but the bulk of the story takes place in the past. Um, it felt like it took place in the 60s and then she said it took place in 1988 and I felt old, <laughs> but it is in the past. So it is historical fiction. So the pandemic doesn't play a big part. A plus book. And then the, the fourth book I finished was this month's Agatha Christie mystery, which was Death in the Clouds. Um, I just started reading or started listening to the All About Agatha episode on this. And in the, the, note, the notes, they say something like it's the proto 1930s version of Snakes on a Plane. And that's not wrong. <laughs> um, someone is killed on a plane. So it's really close miss because it's got to be someone on the plane. What happened? There are things I liked and things I didn't like about this. I liked Perot. This is, you're back to charming Perot, who is just kind of doing his little machinations to figure everything out. Um, we've missed that in, so, in some of the previous novels. Like Murder on the Orient Express has Perot in it throughout, but he's not, there's, you don't get Perot-ness with it. And then Three Act Tragedy, which is the one that came after Murder on the Orient Express, but before this one, you do have that, but you don't have Perot in a lot of the novels. So this is a lot of Perot again. Um, I was actually a little surprised by the um, by the solution, and that's good. There is a ingenue in this. I will say I did not like the ingenue. I, I, I've liked a lot of Agatha Christie's kind of ingenue characters, but I did not like this one. Um, and I think that was a real, for me, with this book. Um, I gave it a B plus because I think generally it's it's... It was irritants that brought it down for me, but the story itself was fairly strong. And it was kind of a very novel concept when you think about it, because this was in the mid thirties and people weren't flying a lot. I mean, that was not now, if you're going to go someplace that's, you know, more than a few hours drive away, the default is to fly, um, before even a road trip. But, um, then that was not the case. So I thought that was like, if you kind of look back and think about it, that was kind of like a very exciting element to this book. So I'm glad I read it. Um, I enjoyed my time with it. I just, there were things in it that kind of irritated me. So those are the four books that I finished this week. Now, according to Goodreads, I have 11 books going. Seven of those books are short story collections, so I'm not including them here. However, Next week's update, they will be included because I'm going to re continue reading through until I finish my in process, um, the, the collections that I have going. So my book count probably until close to the end of the year is going to be quite big just as I whittle those short story collections down. But that's something that's going to start next week. So this week, I currently have four books going that are not short story collections. In print, I have, I am still working on Tightrope 
And my book club's a week from tomorrow, so I need to kind of hop to it and finish it. Still not. I'm still irritated by this book and the fact that childcare is just not a concept so far that they seem to really take into consideration, even though I think it's a really, really huge concept. Um, it's a really huge part in, I'm sorry, I pontificate every week about this, but they put a lot of, if you haven't seen in my, my previous rants about this, they put a, they, they continually put this emphasis on single parent homes. And, and this book is mainly about the rural poor in today's America um, on single parent homes. And that's, first of all, that's a very tricky metric because like if you look at the different metrics that people measure when they're studying things like poverty, there's things like education level and that's pretty straightforward. Do you have a high school diploma? Do you have some college? Do you have, you know, that's, that's what it is. Or um, C1, um, employment, are you fully employed? That's another one. But when they come to like single parent families, that's not, it's a terrific, tricky concept because they're not really measuring single parent families. They're measuring stability in the home for children. And single parent households can be very stable. Now, it might be harder for them to be stable, yes. However, on the flip side, dual parent households can also be very unstable. So, and that's just something to think about when you hear these terms come out. But here, they're throwing the single parent household out like it's an absolute and it's not and they have not once so far so far mentioned availability and affordability of child care which is a huge 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 component of this issue and it's making me mad end of soapbox <laughs> the next print book i just started yesterday and that is the light pirate this is cli-fi i am not far enough in it to really say much about it but there's a hurricane coming and it's in florida um so yeah, <laughs> there you go. Um, I'll, I'll have more to say about this next week. <laughs> but the first chapter, the first part that I've read um, is good. I, I didn't get to read that much of it yesterday because I had some appointments yesterday. So my reading time kind of was a little limited. And now at digital, I have two books going. I have The Daughters of Block Island, which is a net galley book that I really need to finish. <sighs> I may just give up on net galley completely. I'll finish as I can, the books I have out, but I think it's just adding stress to me, just having them. Um, you know, I thought, okay, well, I'll just limit myself to books that I really, really want to read. But that's very tempting. It's still really hard to go in because you see these books and you see the description and you're like, oh, I really, really want to read that, but you don't really by the time you get it. So I might just finish off the NetGalley books I have as I can and then just be done with NetGalley. I don't know, I think it's too much. But anyway, Daughters of Block Island, it's kind of like a girl book, which I don't like, but it's kind of also horror-ish, which I do like. So we'll see how it goes. Um, it's not something that requires a lot of brain power. Um, and I probably should have talked about this of my second two, but we're gonna put a pin in the Daughters of Block Island because I will tell you why in a second. The other book that I am reading is the 14th Ruth Galloway book by Ellie Griffiths, which is The Locked Room. This is the story that where Ruth and everyone, this is when COVID hits. Um, and I talked about with Tom Lake how it's a pandemic novel, but don't worry about it because it's not really a pandemic novel. This one is really a pandemic novel. And um, I was very fortunate in that like the pandemic sucked for everybody, but it didn't suck for me nearly as much as it sucked for a lot of people. You know, we didn't have economic concerns. My husband and I actually get along with each other. Um, the kids were had the the means to be educated at home through distance learning. We had that technology all set up. We generally like each other. It was the best time of my cat's life because everyone was home and no one came to visit. Um, so generally the pandemic wasn't nearly as hard for me as it was for a lot of people. As a result, I tend not to have a problem with, with pandemic novels. Um, you know, the sentence, I could definitely relate to some certain things, but I never felt that sort of crushing urgency that some people have felt with that book because it was written during the pandemic as the pandemic happened and you got a lot of those feelings, which I could appreciate, but I didn't necessarily experience. Now, The Locked Room is interesting because this is the first book I've read and this is not, I mean, I've read other pandemic novels. Um, this is the first one where I'm actually feeling what I call the pandemic crush, where you're getting that really claustrophobic, you know, you're stuck in and it's, it's that anxiety, uh, that anxiety inducing, 
like you're in the trash compactor in Star Wars kind of thing. Um, which is interesting because I would not have expected it from this book. I don't want to go too much into the plot because we're at the point now where anything I say about the plot is going to spoil the overall, like the huge overall plot because we're one book away from the end for now. Um, but I will say kudos to Ellie Griffiths because she really got the pandemic in this really well. Um, it's a page turner. I'm going to finish it today. I, I, it's been kind of a priority read for me because I can't put it down. Um, but I, I'm enjoying it. I mean, I think it's probably her most effective of the series because it's bringing those feelings forward for me that no other pandemic novel has been able to do. So there you go. But I will finish it today. Now, the, the ebook, so let's go back a little bit to the Daughters of Block Island. I've kind of put that one to the side for the locked room because I'd rather read the locked room than the Daughters of Block Island. That's just the truth. The next digital book I have, which is out from the library, um, I can't remember the exact title, but it's a Europa book and it's translated from the Russian and it's long and it's about, from what I understand, um, when Germans, they're called Best Arabian Germans, they came, they, they sort of came to Germany to settle to be farmers, but then they turned into serfs. That's my family. Um, my father's side of the family, they were Best Arabian Germans, and I, I believe the book is about that, which is why I wanted to read it. I have a feeling that's going to be a, a much more, um, it's going to require a lot more mental energy. So it's not going to be a book that I read before bed, which is where I think Daughters of Block Island is going to come back in. So I do hope to have the Daughters of Block Island finished by next week. And I'll still probably be working on this other book, which is called something like The Volga Tale or something. I don't know. You'll hear about it next week. So that's what I have going on. My husband has not come down yet. Yay. Um, not that I don't wanna see my husband. I just didn't want the kitchen sounds going on during this video. Um, yeah, so plans on the vlog, or the, the vlog, the YouTube. Um, Tuesday will be my September wrap up. And then that's the only set in stone kind of video I have going, but other ones will come. Um, because it's a new month starting. It's gonna be October, it's spooky season, yay. So anyway, if you made it through this far, please give me a thumbs up. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. Come see me on my Discord, the details are down below. It's a lot easier to just kind of have a conversation on Discord than it is in the comment section on YouTube. So that's a great place to kind of connect. Um, and thank you very much, I'll see you in the next video.